Cardiff University and today we're going to be examining your questions and your comments based on the things that we've been learning about in the course this week. I'm also joined by Anthony Salomoni who's going to be monitoring Twitter and remember that you can tweet any questions or comments you have throughout the seminar using the hashtag SWVote16. So we start uh, this week with a question from Hugh Jones, who asks an um, interesting point about the frequency of polling having a difference. Why would how often you ask affect the reliability of a poll? Uh, well, I, mean, I think in, in, in principle it, it shouldn't. Certainly um, for telephone polls where you're basically sampling a, a completely fresh sample of new people each time. I mean, the only way that would affect the reliability, I suppose, is if you were doing so many that the company was having to churn through them really quickly and mistakes crept into the process. It's a bit more complicated for online polls where companies have a sort of a panel of people from whom they sample each time. And I suppose if you didn't have a very sufficiently large sample and you're trying to do lots of polls from a relatively small group of people, then it might mean you're going back to the same group of people time and time again. Um, and I think you know, that would start to have an effect um, on, on those people because you know, they're being asked about these questions uh, repeatedly. Um, so that might mean they simply refuse to answer them or maybe you know, the fact that they've been asked them several times over makes them less typical members of the population. So I think frequency shouldn't really affect telephone polls. It should only affect online polls. I say if you have a relatively small group of people from whom you're trying to sample relatively frequently. I think you know, the best companies who are doing online s surveys, you know, that, that shouldn't really be a major problem with them. OK, um, we move on to a, a second question, and this one is about Wales. Uh, Roger uh, from Stephanie, who says that Carwin Jones is, is very popular. Is he more popular than Rodri Morgan, and has he managed to put his mark on Welsh politics, do you think? Uh, I mean, the first part of that um, is a bit difficult to be definitive about because, you know, you have changing question wordings and surveys over time. Rodri Morgan certainly remains to the, the end of his period as First Minister of Wales. He really... Uh, unusually popular for a long-standing political leader. Carwin Jones uh, took over from him um, in late 2009, I think was certainly in his first couple of years very popular and at the time of the 2011 devolved elections uh, parallel surveys ran in Wales and Scotland suggested that he was the most popular single political leader in either territory, more popular than Alex Salmond in Scotland, more popular than any other political leader. Um, it's fair to say, though, that Carwin Jones, while he still remains, I think, something of an electoral asset to Labour in Wales, his popularity has undoubtedly slipped. Uh, one standard way of measuring this is ask people to rate leaders how much they like them on a zero to ten scale. And Carwin Jones has slipped about a whole point on that scale since 2011. That still, though, leaves him as one of the two most popular political leaders in Wales, along with Leanne Wood of Plaid Cymru. So, you know, he's still doing pretty well. In terms of him putting his mark on Welsh politics, well, electorally, he certainly did five years ago. He led Labour to their best ever devolved election performance. In terms of policies, I think he's less obviously identified with sort of landmark or very highly visible policies in the way that Rodri Morgan was linked to things like free prescriptions and free bus travel for, for pensioners in Wales. Uh, I think a couple of his major priorities, Carwin Jones, have been the constitution, trying to get a stable constitutional settlement for Wales, which we've never yet had under devolution and still don't have, and the economy, and, and trying to gradually work to improve Wales' economic performance. So I think those have been particular priority areas of his. Mm. And moving to Scotland, Ilsa, Nick Hubble has a question about the Scottish Conservatives. So he asked that if the con Scottish Conservatives are best at transferring their constituency vote into their list vote, doesn't that suggest that they most rigidly embody a form of exclusive identity politics? I, I wouldn't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, we, we know certain things about, about split ticket voting, about people voting for different parties on different, on different ballots. And, and certainly the recent polling suggests that the Conservatives are able to retain more of their supporters than anyone else. They're able to retain about 80% of their supporters. Uh, Labour and, and the SNP are around 70-65% and the, the Lib Dems significantly behind that, 55% they're retaining. So cl clearly they're doing better now, um, but I think it's less to do with, with identity politics and Britishness, and I think there's two other things going on. One is about how crowded the political spectrum is on different issues, and if you were to imagine 
you know, all the parties strung out from left to right, for example, then you, you've got a, a bunch of parties on the left and center left, and then you've got one party that is pretty much out on its own on, on issues of tax, and it has made every effort to demonstrate that it is out on its own on that issue. And I think if you think of other possible um, spectra that you could draw in terms of the constitutional issue, I think there again, they would argue that they're, they're out on their own. So I think there's a crowded political space issue. That means they're, they're more likely to retain their supporters. And I think there's also a kind of clear vision, not clear vision thing going on as well. And I think um, for certainly we know that there's, so, there's something going on if, when we're looking at the polling results for Labour and Labour supporters, but the Lib Dems as well. They're not always aware of what their party's policies are on certain issues, particularly on the issue of the Constitution. And I think that also makes it harder for parties to retain support. Is this a unique election? I mean, if we look at those figures, I, I was looking at some of the recent polls, and uh, it looks like that we would find about 30% of the electorate splitting their ticket. That in itself is not all that unusual. It's significantly higher than, than in 2011, um, but it's, it's around about in line with what we saw in 2007, uh, which was about 30%, 27, 30% of people reporting that they, they split, their, um, split their support across two different parties. So it's, it's, it's not all that unusual. And I don't think it's necessarily as a result of pursuing a policy of, of narrow identity politics. Mm. And when we say split ticket, Ilsa, that means someone's voting for one party one in the party. and then another party in the region. Absolutely, absolutely. And we know that there are certain things that are likely to make people more or less likely to do that. We know a strong sense of partisanship means someone is le least likely to split their votes across two different parties. But also personalities matter. You know, if you have a strong affinity, not just for the party, so a sense of party identification or you belong to the party, but also if you particularly like the candidate that's running in your constituency and the candidates that are standing in your region, then you're less likely to split your, your, your ticket. There are reasons that we know encourage people to do so. Sometimes there's an element of strategic voting there. And we know that for some people, there is a deliberate attempt to introduce balance into the legislature. But the extent to which that's going on varies, is, is perceived to vary from one election to the next. Okay, and now we have a question from Andrew Dahl about the Labour Party in Scotland and Wales. So why did the Labour Party in Scotland lose the support of the people whilst the Labour Party in Wales kept it? Was it down purely to Labour in Scotland joining with the Conservative Party for Better Together or was there a problem before this? Was there longer term issues of decline for Labour in Scotland? I think I can answer half of the, okay. half of the question. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, it's not new. Okay. It's not new and it's certainly not even since the referendum. So I think if... I think there's a lot of things going on. I think there's the fact that we have, um, we have Joanne Lamont's claim that the Labour Party in Scotland has typically been treated as a branch mm. party of London. I think that's a, a criticism that resonates with voters. I think we have the opposition, uh, the, the electorate's opposition to the Labour Party's stance on the war in Iraq and the invasion of Iraq. I think that has to be seen to ha be one part of the puzzle. So, some, so the undoing of Labour can have its roots in things that happened as far back as 2003. Um, we, know that, um, we know that there is a perception that Scottish Labour MPs were perhaps not as engaged in the referendum as they might have been, perhaps assuming what the result of the referendum might have been. We know that the Labour Party under Ed Miliband was perceived to be a more English party than it had been under even Tony Blair, but also Gordon Brown. People in England might say it's not an English party so much as a Southern English party, but there, I mean, the, the, the roots of that undoing are, don't necessarily track specifically back to the referendum. I think the referendum is part of the answer, but I don't think it's the whole answer. And when we were doing polling, we were looking at polling from 2010, 2011, and we were asking questions about who best stands up for Scotland. You know, Labour would do well in that question in the early days of devolution, but, you know, 2009, 10, 11, we were already starting to see a significant gap between how the SNP was performing on that question and how Labour was performing on that question. So looking back on those data now, we can see that the, you know, the, the undoing is not just aligning themselves with the Conservative Party. Surely that might, might have had an impact for one, one part of the electorate, but I don't think it's the whole answer. Mm. And in Wales, Roger, why is it not well, going the same way? Yeah, I'm not, I was going to say it's... It's worth remembering uh, on election day in 2011, in Scotland, the Labour Party had, thus far at least, its worst ever devolved election. The SNP had their best. 
In Wales, you had the exact opposite happening. The Labour Party having their best ever devolved election, uh, Ply Cymru having their worst ever one. Now, what's that about? I think looking at it from Wales, it seems to me that some of that is about the behaviour of the Labour Party in the two nations, and some of it's about the behaviour of their opponents. In terms of the Labour Party, and I think following directly from what Elsa was saying, um, it seems to me the Labour Party in Wales has politically you know, managed sort of the politics of devolution much more shrewdly than the Labour Party in Scotland. I think you know, the Labour Party in Scotland became identified sort of as you know, the voice piece, you know, the mouthpiece of the centre of, of London. Whereas I think in Wales it's protected its identity as Welsh Labour much more cleverly, certainly since Rodri Morgan became leader and then Carwin Jones took over. I mean, Welsh Labour is to some extent, you know, has, has been able to get some of the sort of soft nationalist territory, which I think in, in Scotland has largely uh, you know, jumped to the SNP, did so several years ago. I think also you need to say that the Welsh Labour Party, both with Rodri Morgan and Carwin Jones, this comes back to the earlier question, have had two successive pretty politically successful and popular leaders, whereas the Scottish Labour Party has had um, a whole series of, of leaders of, it seems, gradually declining mm. success and popularity. But we also need to look at their opponents, particularly their main opponents on the centre-left. Um, lots of people forget now that in the first devolved elections in 1999, across the two ballots, Plaid Cymru actually had a higher share of the vote than did the SNP in Scotland. Now, I mean, that seems almost unimaginable mm. today. And what's happened since then? Well, the last decade or so, the SNP have been led by two extraordinarily gifted uh, political leaders. Uh, and to put it bluntly, I mean, for a decade and more, Plaid Cymru simply were not. And I think particularly their previous leader, Yane Wynne-Jones, was in many respects a very successful, skillful politician, but he was lacking in a broader voter appeal. And so we saw Plaid drifting electorally for a decade and more um, to, you know, to their worst ever results in 2011, and when Leanne Wood became leader of the party in 2012, she was inheriting a party that had had declining performance at Westminster elections, had just had its worst ever Welsh Assembly election, um, and has only you know, slowly been able to start to rebuild its support. So I think you know, the su relative success of the Labour Party, it's, a lot of it is about what Labour has done, but also a significant part is about what Labour's main opponents on the centre-left have done. Mm. Jumping in on that, I mean, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I, th I think in, in Scotland as well, there, there has been this, this perception that, that, that devolution was, was delivered in part because Labour won the, won, won the election, and so it, it, it brought in the opportunity for a referendum, and, and this, here was this great plan for, for, for devolution. And there was this sense that th what the constitutional platform or preference of the Labour Party was after devolution never really crystallised. And I think that was hampered by the fact that it was not only leading a coalition government for the first two terms in Scotland, but simultaneously government de forming a government down in, in London. And so it, it didn't perhaps feel the need to articulate a vision for the future in a way that it might have developed had it been facing a different government down in, down in London. So in a way its success was a complicating factor. But I think, nonetheless, it, it is clear that voters are not clear on what the Labour Party's preference for the constitutional settlement for Scotland is. And we see that also in the sense that when we ask voters who are sympathisers with Labour how they feel about different constitutional preferences, they are more likely than the supporters of other parties to say they don't know. And if we ask them about the preferences of the Labour Party in particular, they are also more likely to say they don't know. So you get this sense of supporters who have been denied the cues that they want from a party that they typically have been supporting. And so we're seeing Labour supporters not necessarily jumping ship and, and joining other parties or voting for other parties, although we are seeing that. Yes. What we're also seeing are Labour voters saying, well, you know what, I'm undecided or I'm not going to vote. And if you, if you start to do some digging around who's not voting or who's deciding really late in the day, it's often Labour supporters who are, who are missing cues, critical cues from the party on how they should interpret different issues. Mm. And I think that's clearest on the constitutional issue, but it's not just on the constitutional issue. And I think that's one thing that's been managed perhaps poorly or could have been managed in a different way. 
Okay, and at this point we'll go to Twitter. And Anthony, do we have any questions or comments from Twitter? Yes, Alan, we've got a question on Twitter from Tom Cavanaugh who asks, um, is the EU Remain or Leave campaigns an issue in the Scottish elections and the Welsh elections? Um, we've also got some questions from the forums. We've got one from Mozza Malone who asks, um, can you have a good government without an effective opposition? And finally, we've got a question also from the forums from Joy Dillon saying that she notes that the majority of the party leaders in Scotland are female, I'm sorry, in Wales and in Scotland are female. They seem to be well respected and admired by their colleagues and the public, uh, regardless of how well their parties are doing. Has this always been the case? Alan. Okay, thanks, Anthony. So we start with this question from Tom on the impact of the EU referendum. Has there been an impact of the EU referendum in Wales, Roger? Yeah, I think the major impact is that um, it's really been sort of drowning out um, a lot of attention in, in the main news media to the Welsh Assembly election. I think in you know, Wales we have a relatively weak sort of indigenous Welsh news media. Most people who read a newspaper read a paper that's edited in London and those papers don't pay a great deal of attention to Welsh politics, <laughs> if any attention at all. Um, similarly in the main news broadcasts uh, produced by London there's been very little uh, at all about the Welsh Assembly election. Um, it's fair to say, you know, give them credit, both BBC Wales and ITV Wales have been producing specialist programmes you know, on their limited resources, I think, doing a very good job. But you know, those programmes only reach a certain number of um, voters. So I think you know, a first issue is just simply that attention to the Assembly election has been, has been rather drowned out. And I suspect that might mean that turnout this year is relatively low. The previous lowest turnout for a Welsh Assembly election was in 2003, the only time turnout has dipped below 40%. Of course, that was the year when, for the first half of the year, the news coverage was almost entirely dominated by coverage of the Iraq war. Um, and so I think you know, we, we've got another big political issue that's dominating news coverage, which I think might lead to a lower turnout. The other major impact that it seems to be ha having is, I think, particularly on the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party started this year in Wales, in very confident mood. They've made ground at every single assembly election since 1999, and they're expecting to make further ground. But what we've seen over the last two to three months is you know, very public divisions in the Conservative Party being ar argued out. We've also seen, there's quite a lot of evidence of at least some Conservative activists and representatives in Wales, well, apparently spending quite a lot of their time already campaigning for the EU referendum, particularly for, for the Leave side, maybe not putting as much attention and effort into the, to the National Assembly election as you would expect. So you know, that could hurt the Conservatives' ground game. More generally, you know, the Conservatives are very publicly advertising their divisions. And if there's almost one iron law of electoral politics, it's that divided parties do not tend to do well in elections. So you know, we've seen in Wales in the last couple of months the Conservatives' poll ratings go into reverse, and all of a sudden it looks as if they may well actually lose ground at this year's Assembly election, when two to three months ago, I think a lot of people are expecting them to make significant ground. Mm. And what about the referendum in Scotland? Has it had as much of an impact here? No, I would, I would say it's a slightly different situation. And, and in part because I think there's, there's clear majority support for Remain in Scotland. And so that changes the, the, the context of the debate. I think that's something that is worth keeping in mind. The second is that the, the referendum and the subsequent UK general election seem to... Con you know, we often talk about a distinction between first order and second order elections. And first order elections are the ones that are really important in people's minds. It really matters that you turn out to vote. It really matters who wins that election. The policies from that government make a difference in our lives. And there's often this argument that first order elections are Westminster elections and other elections, referendums, they're, they're second order contests. And I think that's never really been the case in Scotland. But we have, I think, since the referendum, it is indisputable that it, people are thinking of Scottish Parliament elections as first order elections. And so because of that, we're not, we're not really spending an awful lot of time debating things that are not relevant to the Scottish Parliament elections. And so, you know, we're talking about governance issues. We're talking about uh, areas of jurisdiction. We're talking about what, what the Parliament's going to do with the new powers it's getting, uh, what, what it's going to do with the powers that it, that it has, the different options that are available to parties. I mean, these are, these are involved debates of, of, about of policy options. I mean, it, it feels differently from the referendum, but it doesn't necessarily feel differently from the last 
Scottish Parliament election, and I think that's something that's worth that's worth keeping in mind. And I think, to the extent that it is relevant, it's it's you know what would happen where Scotland to vote to remain within the EU and the rest of the UK votes to, to leave, would that trigger another independence referendum? But I think the SNP has been very clear about what its view of things are. And, and I think everyone's kind of in a kind of, well, well, let's wait and see. First, let's choose the government that's going to you know, decide on, on policy that's important to us. And then we'll deal with the issue of the European Union. But I think that's only possible because there is a large consensus in terms of what, what the preferred option is with respect to Europe and Scotland. Is there that consensus in Wales as well? Is Wales a pro-EU part of the UK? Uh, to a significantly lesser extent. Right. I mean, if you look at the public opinion data on this, there's a pretty consistent pattern. I mean, you know, little bits fluctuations from survey to survey, but there are clear and consistent majorities for Remain in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, and England and Wales are both looking much closer. Wales, probably on average, tends to be slightly more pro-Remain than England, but, but there isn't a great deal in it. Um, you know, the most recent poll published on Monday in Wales had, I think, a four-point lead for Remain. The previous one had, I think, a three-point lead for Leave. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly still in the balance in Wales and in England in ways in which it really isn't looking like being in Scotland or indeed uh, in Northern Ireland. Mm. Okay. Um, does a, a good government need a, a good opposition? Um, I think it helps. I mean, I, in the short term, I think it's always politically easier for a government to have a weak opposition. I mean, you, you don't have people giving you a really hard time scrutinising you, putting expert questions that unpick the uh, weaknesses in your arguments and your policies. You know, in the short term, every political party governing wants their opposition to be as weak as possible. In the longer term, I think you know, for good governance generally, uh, opposition a strong opposition is, is a very important part of a healthy political system, both in terms of effective scrutiny from day to day, but also in terms of basically making a government feel that they have to perform well because if they don't, they'll be out at the next election. You know, if a party feels that, it, frankly, it doesn't matter what we do because you know, <laughs> we're still going to win next time anyway, you know, complacency can set in. Uh, the other thing, which I think is a very important part of good government, of course, is within a parliament, not just effective opposition, but effective committee structures, mm. which scrutinise all of the detailed work of policy and of lawmaking. Um, and often, you know, if, if they're doing their job effectively, stop things going wrong before you know, it actually leads to disaster. You know, an awful lot of political coverage of what government does is sort of what happens after you know, the car has crashed. Um, Whereas uh, I think you know, an effective committee structure is all about stopping the car crashing in the first place um, and uh, preventing mistakes being enacted in law, scrutinising policy making so it is actually conducted effectively and well. Mm. Okay, um, we'll go back to one of our other questions here from Elizabeth Laird, um, who's talking about the Lib Dems in Wales. What will happen to them in the Assembly if they aren't able to form a group? Well, they need to have three members of the Assembly to form an official party group. Uh, they won six members in the first three elections. In 2011, under some pressure, they just about held on to five seats. This time round, it's looking as if even five seats may be difficult for them. Um, they hold only one constituency seat at the moment, Brecon and Radnor, held by their party leader, Kirsty Williams. Now that was a seat which in the general election last year was won by the Conservatives really pretty comfortably. Um, I think, you know, the Conservatives' recent troubles certainly gives Kirsty Williams a, a better chance of holding on to that seat. And she's an effective and popular politician. If, you know, if anyone can hold that constituency for the Lib Dems, it will be her. But I think she's still going to have a relatively tough fight. The four regional list seats the Lib Dems hold were all won as the final list seat allocated in the respective regions last time. So all of those are ultra marginal. And if the Lib Dems vote slips a bit, or in fact, even if it doesn't s slip at all, all of those could go, particularly with UKIP now also being a competitor for list seats. So the Lib Dems are really in Wales in a fight for survival. And if they end up with only one seat or even potentially zero seats in the assembly, you know, they really are into a sort of existential crisis about the whole future of their party. Um, 
you know, if she loses her seat, I suspect Kirsty Williams might well feel compelled to resign. There's no obvious successor fee, uh, you know, leader figure for the party in Wales. Certainly, it's very doubtful that any anyone would be as a, as effective as she has been you know, against very difficult political circumstances. So, I think you know, for the Lib Dems in the immediate term, it's just a fight for survival. And you know, after the election, you know, they will hope to have a few a few seats and hope that the broader political context in Britain will start to become more favourable to them. Um, I mean, at the moment, it's just more or less as it has been for pretty much the last six years, you know, ever since the ink dried on the coalition deal in London, that uh, they are very much battling against you know, very heavy political headwinds and you know, still you know, really struggling for survival. Yeah. And we don't yet know whether they are actually going to, whether that struggle will be successful this time. And just quickly on UKIP, Roger, um, Elizabeth has also yeah. asked about um, if there's a stable presence in Wales for UKIP, would that change the way UKIP presents itself? Well, I think it's, you know, UKIP have, have targeted Wales for some time now, really since the last European elections in 2014, as a place where they could make a serious breakthrough. Um, you know, if, if UKIP score anywhere close to their current poll rating, they will win several regional list seats in Wales. And that will be their first major bridgehead in a domestic UK legislature. Uh, and I think you know, the parties see that as a potential to help establish and entrench them for the long term. At the same time, I think it has to be said that there may be problems with that strategy. If you look at the individuals who are likely to be elected, some of them have already been publicly squabbling uh, amongst each other. Um, it's by no means clear that the potential UKIP group in the Assembly would be remotely stable or harmonious as an entity. You could well see it fracturing um, into two or even several, several pieces. So you know, there will be a challenge for UKIP if they win significant representation in the Welsh Assembly to use that representation to help build the reputation of the party. Um, I think that's been Nigel Farage's strategy to, in local councils and in places like the Welsh Assembly, build bridgeheads and try to use that to build the long-term strength of the party. But that depends on the people who get elected in those councils and in, in that assembly acting in ways that bolster the reputation of the party. And if we look at a lot of UKIP groups in local councils, they haven't done that. Mm. And so it's been I mean, an interesting feature of the last few months since the general election in local council by-elections in places where UKIP have won seats before, they're doing almost uniformly dreadfully in local council by-elections. And I think a lot of that is to do with the fact that the sort of people UKIP have been electing have not generally been effective representatives whose, you know, whose work in councils has brought great credit to yeah. UKIP. They will have to behave differently in the Welsh Assembly if they are to use a breakthrough in the Welsh Assembly election for the long-term benefit of their party. Mm. And a question from um, Motsa Malun, uh, Ilsa, about um, electoral behaviour. She, so, she, she asks that in a previous political science course that they were taught that people's political allegiances are like an old-fashioned photo clear, a photo clear and sharp in the early days and then fade and go out of focus with age. Um, do you think that's the case? Yeah, I mean, there's, just, there's different theories of voting and why people make the choices that they do. And some of them are really good at explaining stability and some of them are really good at explaining change. And so what you want is the, is the theory that kind of suits both of those circumstances. So we know that, say, the sociological theories are saying, well, you tend to hang around with people like you, you tend to share the same kind of values, you tend to listen to elites within those groups, and then you, you, you tend to align yourselves with different parties. And that was always the argument for class-based um, a class-based party system in, in the UK. But we, we know there are other models, the social psychological model, economic models, that say, well, actually what matters is people's assessments of government performance, what matters is, you know, valence issues like management of the economy, that kind of thing. So there's, there's, there's different models trying to do different things. In terms, of, in, in terms of people's identification with different parties, we, we know those do change. We, we get these periods of alignment where people tend to align themselves with political parties. Then we get these moments of de-alignment when people detach themselves from the parties and they might stay detached or they might realign themselves with that original party or they might realign themselves with a different party. And so you find yourself looking at party systems that are going through periods of stability and periods of flux. And I think clearly we're going through a period of flux 
in Scotland. And, and what's, what's not clear, however, is whether, you know, if we're thinking in the largest groups, the largest shifts, we're, we're very interested in Labour voters and what they're doing now and are they the voters who are switching to the SNP. I mean, I think the, the SNP is picking up votes in a, for a number of different reasons. I think it's picking up votes because it is winning the argument about, about government and, and ab about governance and, it, and it's, it's seen to be governing well. And I think there's a separate way in which they are winning votes, which is you know, attempting to win the argument about the merits of independence. But I think there are two different things going on. And, I, and I, you know, as I was saying earlier, those Labour supporters, some of them have detached themselves from the Labour Party, but they haven't necessarily reattached themselves to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And they haven't actually made the proper break from the Labour Party. They would rather hold fire and not vote at all or make up their minds at the last moment, or split their ballot and maybe vote for Labour on one, but someone else on another, rather than necessarily realign themselves with others. But you know, partisan identification varies. You, you get countries where we find people's partisan identifications are more stable and solid, and those where they're weaker. And we also see that there are changes over time. And clearly, we're, we're in a period of flux in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I mean, with Wales, I think we've certainly seen a weakening of many people's sort of traditional identification with the Labour Party, you know, the, the long dominant party in Welsh politics. What we haven't yet seen is any sort of realignment towards yeah. an alternative. So I think we've seen in, in recent years quite a lot of Labour supporters being pretty soft. And in some of the lower turnout elections, it simply hasn't shown up at, at the ballot box. But there's been no sort of you know, surge for any alternative in the way that we've seen in the last, particularly the last few years here uh, for the SNP. Mm. Okay, at that point we'll go to Anthony and see if we have any other questions from Twitter. Uh, yes, Alan, we've got a question in particular from the forum uh, from Sandy Johnson, which asks, what are the prospects for there being a coalition or minority government after the elections? And what kind of particular leader would a minority government need to be successful? Um, we've also got a question from Stephen Williams, who asks, um, is the alternative member system, particularly in Wales, no longer fit for purpose, considering um, the vote shares they predicted along with the seat shares. And we've also got a final question from Twitter um, asking, uh, what's the significance of the Welsh elections, in particular in UK national politics? Does it really matter at national level? And that's from Sambit Paul. Alan. OK, Anthony, thank you very much. Um, should we start with Stephen's question, Ilse, about whether the additional member system is fit for purpose? It depends what you think the purpose <laughs> was, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, and we get different arguments about this. You know, you, we, we have the history of that period um, kind of retold in different ways. And by one reckoning, it's, it, it, you know, the AMS system was designed to exclude the nationalists and prevent there ever being a, a referendum or a nationalist government. That is one, one line um, that's out there in terms of, um, in terms of why, why AMS was a good idea. The other argument is that it was all about power sharing. And, and if, you, if you look at the different documents, you know, after the failed referendum and all the, the different documents of the different commissions and coalitions and, um, and uh, culminating in the report of the consultative steering group, you know, the, a lot of the principles are quite common across those documents. And power sharing, both within the institution and this notion that power is something that is sh you know, drawing closer links between the electorate and the institutions, I mean, that theme is, is quite common. So it's a credible claim that it was about... Um, power sharing, whether it's fit for purpose. I mean, w one thing about, the, uh, about AMS is that the corrective capacity of the regional lists depends on two things. One, it depends on the proportion of regional seats to constituency seats. And we know that's different across the, yeah. two, across the two settlements. But the other is that, in a way, the, the corrective capacity is at its best when people vote consistently. And if you split your ballots, the corrective capacity is lost a little way, uh, uh, to a certain extent. And so, you know, when we see campaigns for electoral reform in different places, we often see mixed member proportional AMS uh, seen as a, 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 a great way to retain the familiar elements of a territorial link of first past the post with some degree of proportionality. And so sometimes when we see those proposals, for example, I think when, when there were proposals to do this in Quebec, they said, well, no, 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 you wouldn't have two votes. You'd have one vote, and it would count in a constituency contest and a regional contest. And their argument was you get the best corrective factor um, when, you, when you assume that people have consistent preferences across, 
uh, across those two ballots. But what that, under, what that denies people is an, is an opportunity for, to express political preferences in a different way. So fit for purpose depends on your assessment of the purpose. Um, what about uh, Cindy's question about coalition and minority government? Does that need to require a different type of leadership? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you know, we're almost certain to get a minority government in Wales unless something fairly extraordinary happens in the last week or so of the campaign. Um, you know, even in its best year in 2011, Labour couldn't win a majority. They're currently you know, 10 to 15 points lower in the polls than they were this time in 2011, so they're very unlikely to win a majority this year. At the same time, no other party is coming along to win a majority. So we're going to be in a position where, you know, all parties will be short of majority. I think at the moment it's looking as if the only two politically and arithmetically workable um, options will be Labour minority government or Labour applied coalition. Um, it, it's possible the, the maths may work for Labour Liberal Democrat coalition, but that's looking odds against at the moment. Um, and you know, there'll then be a political decision from Labour implied as to which option they go for. Uh, I mean, we've had experience of minority government in Wales, we've had it in, in Scotland, you know, to varying degrees of success, I think, according to various people's judgments. I think it's certainly, to be reasonably effective, it needs the party in government to be you know, relatively sort of politically clever, sensitive to uh, the views and concerns of other political parties, a certain willingness to compromise and, and work together. Um, and, you know, people can have varying judgments about the extent to which different political leaders uh, possess those, those gifts. Um, you know, a, a majority co a coalition, such as we had, say, in Wales, you know, 2011, 2011, which has a, a pretty big majority when you put the two parties together, clearly makes it easier for governments to do things like get their legislation through. Uh, and maybe to plan for the longer term. So maybe they can be a bit more strategic in some senses. Um, on the other hand, in a minority government, you know, well, they can do fewer things, but maybe that also means they can do fewer thi bad things. You know, <laughs> it makes them harder to implement their ideas, but that includes all the bad ideas as well as all the good ones. Uh, and you have to go out and win support from other political forces to get some things through. I, I suppose minority government maybe can be particularly difficult in the period leading up to the next election, when everyone is thinking fairly short term about the forthcoming election, um, and you know, maybe the interests of good governance rather go out the window. Hmm. Okay, and we added another question there just about the significance of the Welsh election in the UK context. Um, I think a lot of people would say the Welsh election has almost no significance at all in the, in the UK context. Um, but they'd be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course they would be wrong. Um, I think, you know, I mean, if, if Labour were to be fantastically successful, do I think outperform most people's expectations, that would certainly be taken by at least some supporters of Jeremy Corbyn as a vindication of his political agenda. I mean, I'm not sure that would be right, but that would, I think, be the way it would be interpreted. Similarly, if Labour were to have a particularly bad election this year, I think that would be seen as reflecting not only on Carwin Jones and the Welsh Labour Party, but also on Jeremy Corbyn as a whole. Um, I think, you know, uh, if we were to see a major breakthrough for Plaid Cymru, that could uh, at least have some reverberations in terms of, you know, an SNP government in Scotland plus a strong Plaid Cymru presence. It starts to, I think, maybe get more people thinking about the whole future of the United Kingdom. And I think if UKIP were to have a genuinely major breakthrough in Wales this year, that potentially has important implications for their long-term uh, future uh, and importance as a political party right across Britain. So, you know, although some people initially might think that the Welsh election actually doesn't have resonance and, and impacts right across Britain, in a number of important respects it could have. Hmm. Anthony, do we have any final questions from Twitter? from Twitter, it's from Daniel Muir who asks, why did all the parties standing in Scotland wait until the postal votes have been sent out before publishing their manifestos? Why did the parties wait until the postal votes were sent out before they're publishing late, their manifestos? Aren't they? They're, yeah. they're late, they're really yeah. late and they're getting later. This is the, yeah. the well, latest. Coming up today. today. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're really late and I, I, I don't know what to think of that. If, it, if it's just a cynical ploy, if it's out there 
for less time, there's less, you know, less opportunity to tear it apart. I don't know. I, I would like to think that it's not because they've been drafting it right up until the last minute. It's just, it, it, you're right. I, it, it, um, it's a curious decision, particularly from parties that are not in the lead. You know, if you, if you, you, you politics fundamentally is an argument about how best to run society. And you're, as a party, you're engaging in that argument. You're saying, well, this is my view of how we should run society. And you're not necessarily doing yourself the, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't, if you don't list your arguments for, for how you want to run a better society. And I, and I think if you're a party that's coming from behind, if you're a party that's been falling in the polls over the last decade, then why on earth you wouldn't want to come out, come out early, come out swinging, is, is, not, um, is not too, too clear to me. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in Wales Labour published their manifesto a week ago, and some of their people argue, well, that was, we, we wanted it to be out and to maximise the news attention just as postal ballots were arriving at people's homes. Um, they were starting to complete them. So, you know, they, they argue that was, you know, strategically a sensible thing for them to do. On the other hand, Ply Cymru came out with their manifesto, I think, around two full weeks earlier than the Labour Party did. Um, and, and their view was, well, you know, we have a very detailed manifesto. We've worked on these ideas for a long time. You know, we want to get them out there as soon as possible. Um, certainly, looking at it from the outside, publishing your manifesto only eight days before the yeah. election, which Scottish Labour are doing, does seem very strange. Uh, and as Elsa says, particularly for a party that's behind. And you know, if you have confidence in your own ideas, you would surely want to be projecting them as soon as possible and as strongly as possible. Um, it does seem strange, but you know, perhaps there's some really clever political thinking behind this. I just haven't worked out what it is. <laughs> OK, on that note, my thanks to Ilsa, to Roger and to Anthony. Um, next week is the week of the election. Um, we'll be back at the same time next week, um, just the day before the election, Wednesday at 10 past one, to discuss more of the issues. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>